presented is some of the preliminary remarks. I will not have to, I will be very brief because we have discussed a lot about it. And uh, I thought um, that it was interesting of two papers with uh, Professor Bertos because I thought that uh, maybe we, uh, we would be at the extremity of the same spectrum, you know, the brain on one side, the culture and the society on the other side, other culture. But in fact, I, by listening to you, I felt it does not work at all like that. So it, uh, I felt it intersecting together. I don't know how. <laughs> I will have to think about but I can see it's exciting. It was exciting because it was not so simple as just the brain and the society. Okay, so let me begin now with my three preliminary remarks. So the first one, I, d I will be very, very short because we did not stop talking about it today. I think we have, you know, one kind of thing of in terms of another. I think it illustrates perfectly many of the paper, at least of today. So lack of, okay, I, you all, I suppose all of you know him. So it's a metaphor is useful for a lot of reasons. So this was my first remark. Second also will be very short. Sorry, so I did the drawing quickly. So it was uh, the, but also we spoke, about, we talked about it yesterday. So the, what is interesting as an anthropologist with robots, the category of humanoid robots, is if, if you speak with people about robots, you have the reality of robots, industrial robots, and how many in the world, uh, 3,000 3, humanoid robots, or may, maybe even less, what we saw with, uh, together with Jean-Paul. And when people s discuss about robots, they discuss only the first reflex about the humanoid robots. But they don't discuss, uh, and this you have the theory of prototype, of lack of. They take as prototype of the category of robots something which is not representative of its category, this is the first point. Second point is something which is not even in the category because, in fact, if they, a few of them will, turn, will think about a demonstration uh, video. And we know that you showed it also yesterday, uh, Boston Dynamic and so on, is that is uh, very far from year to year. And most of the people will, uh, will not have seen the demonstration video, so they will think about science fiction. So basically, it's the only category I know in technology because it's a technological category. If you think about, for example, uh, the internet, the web, the mobile, and so on, uh, nobody knows how it works. But basically, we know what we refer to. We refer more or less, when we speak of a mobile or of a computer, to the object which is the computer. What is very, it will change. I don't say at all, I don't speak what is going to happen later on. But now what is very interesting for the last 10 years, and I, I have the feeling it may change quite quickly, but we don't know, is when you speak, it's maybe the only technological category where people speak of something which has nothing to do with the object itself. Uh, now, third, wait, I have gone too quickly, yes. So this was first other observation is uh, when you read about uh, uh, all the discussion about humanoid robotics, something I feel interesting, I am not going to go back to uh, uh, all this uh, transhumanist thing, just to make a point. You know, you have, you have uh, on the one side, uh, you have the singularity. And basically, what is there? is the idea it's something very exceptional. You know, something we have never known, that we can't understand what is going to happen, which uh, I will not go on this point. It's also slightly contradictory with the second idea that somebody has talked about that we, we tried to get it for the last 500 years or 600 years, but it's a sort, some sort of eschatology, you know? And there we have this idea. But you have another big theme, which is the other species metaphor. 
what is very interesting in it, and I could show also in the other case, that it's not simply, you know, very extreme people and very extreme theory. For example, you had a very good, it's a very good emission, maybe some have seen it, rise, uh, rise of the Robots, which have been made by uh, BBC, Channel 4, and so on, and uh, so which is more or less equivalent of RT. And basically, the idea is that uh, another species is how they introduce it for educated people, is amongst us coming to the amongst us. So what, what you do with these two ideas, yeah, wait, this is my third remark. A very, you suddenly you realize it's something v that we know very well about, which is the debate between creationism and evolutionism in, on the other end. And if you look at it, most of uh, the presentation of uh, robots and humanoid robots today, in fact, is not much more than a simple repetition of a very Anglo-Saxon debate between, on the one side, crea creationism, and on the other side, uh, a sort of neo-post uh, uh, fake Darwinism and, uh, and on the side creationism. So the scheme uh, in terms of motif, uh, I think some of you talk about, I think it's quite interesting to have. Now my third point now, because I said I am not afraid of metaphor, so I propose you one. This is used, uh, you know, it is a metaphor itself. It's used for the presentation of the CERN, the European Center for uh, nuclear for uh, nuclear uh, physics and so on and i think what i i, I tell you how i understand today um, um, humanoid robot and experiment humanoid robot as an anthropologist i speak from my very restricted point of view very small one which is of an anthropologist for me i see it as a as the same sort of experiment that you that uh, physicists are doing at the CERN. What do we get uh, when we when we observe humanoid robot as I have I, as I have made uh, in the Musée du Quai Branly? We have a very very small moment, very fragile moment, something which may be an artifact, but which is interesting because suddenly we have for a very small amount of time a process of dissociation. What sort of dissociation, uh, and all my paper will be about it, it's a dissociation between two notions, two anthropological notions which are very common. One, human nature, and the other, the notion of the person. Suddenly, as we will see, people dissociate for a small moment of time in a very precise context, like a ritual, the two, you know. And we will see this is at the stage where we are in Europe. It's a very, very brief moment. It can be two minutes, three minutes, the people we have seen. But the point, my point is, you may make of this a culture, an ontology with that. It's what we will see later. OK, that's why, so it's my preliminary remark. My tools, just to be very quickly, because I am not so many anthropologists here. This is cultural comparativism. It's a local divinity with whom I work. And this is the robot that we did with colleagues, which is called Berenson. We named it. We are not afraid of name. And Berenson was a very famous art critic of the 19th end of the beginning of 20th century. And uh, uh, this robot is made in order to have some sort of uh, uh, is visiting basically museums. There we are in the underground of the Cape Only. Okay, so I go quickly. Um, so my two my two field work, as we say, I, and to say an anthropologist, we are a bit more. We we don't measure. We don't have good measurement. We are more like at the beginning of uh, people who observe animal animal on the outside. So we make observation. You know. So it has a scientific status which is not completely obvious. It's uh, like uh, if you read Conrad Lorenz or these people, the beginning of physiology, animal ethology, I think we are a bit at the same stage. We don't, uh, we observe things, but it's not, uh, it's anthropology. Okay, so we, 
two, my two observations would be with Romeo, that most of you know about, where I was there when they were uh, conceiving it, or some part of it at least. And the other one will be people reacting to the robot we did observe. First with Romeo. So what is interesting, you have two drawings. None of them is very good, but uh, they are very interesting for me because they are completely uh, different drawings. They, they tell, as you would say, completely different stories. This drawing is made by an engineer uh, working on Romeo. This drawing is made on a, a by a designer, young designer, young engineer, both of them working on Romeo, on the la, le bras. So I don't know you call this part of a, yeah, uh, where the arm basically <laughs> this part of it, and the and the end. Okay, so why are why are they two completely different story? Because the first story is uh, it's what we are discussing. We have uh, it's really all your paper was about uh, in some way. It's a biomimetic, I would call it like that inspiration. This much better drawing you will recognize who has done it, and. Uh, Basically, what did this engineer was very simple in terms of, not in terms of all history, as you will know, but in terms of the shortcut. He was, why he was drawing it for making the end of Romeo, he was looking at his end all the time, and he was drawing his end. You know, so it's how he built it, I saw it, so we see a few. It's really, it was drawing he did for himself, it was not for me, no, nothing like that. Finally, you have the simulation of the end. Uh, I make the story short. You have the small plastic bit, huh? and this. OK, so this is the Romeo. Now, what is interesting with this there is we're in a very, very classical epistemology, which is the epistemology which began in France basically in 17th century, and which is going on up to now. And the idea is to make a story really too short. Word is a machine, a machine of machine. Understanding it, the best way of understanding it is to be able to reproduce, to make machine which reproduce this word. It's how you make, uh, it's a, if I have to say very shortly, the history of science and uh, with the people with all the reading behind, it would be this sentence. So we have one story. Now we have a completely second story when we are in humanoid robots, which is the robot as a mask. So I want to just make you to notice this one point, which is important. Is there you reproduce, it's biomimetic, but as you said, as you can see, it does not mean, of course, yes, that you reproduce exactly what you do. He has only four fingers because it was more you, it was how we were not going. Okay, so now the robot has a mask. And what is interesting is we are in a completely different story. Why? Because the, I, I quote, it would be exactly the same t sentence that uh, Pascal, uh, it's another of uh, Hegel, user, but it's the same idea, that, uh, but by Levi-Strauss, by one of your colleagues. So the, it's the idea that uh, what is interesting to to understand the mask is to understand not only what it represents but what it excludes you know and what is interesting in the first case is when you exclude for example things as a roboticist doing the function of the end or the walk and so on it's because you would have the ideal this that it worked better so you know that you don't do it, but you you point toward an ideal. Uh, I think you you would agree you would agree with that. Now, if you are with the appearance of the robot, in case of humanoid robot, we are in a completely different logic, because what happened is this what we spoke of uh, Anson at some point, that it has been more or less it's very uh, limit experiment. It's experience that people are not repeating. In fact, what people do, the common idea, if you ask a young designer to make a humanoid robot, or maybe a, a 400 roboticists on 401, they would use the, the idea of Mori about that it's not a good idea 
to make a robot which is too, uh, which resembles too much to hum a human for a lot of reasons. My interest here is not to say if the theory of the uncanny valley is is right or not right. It's another discussion. It's very interesting, but it's not my point here. What interests me is that people, when they make uh, the appearance of a robot, what is their inspiration? They don't look at the body, at their body at all. What they look, they look at uh, science fiction. They look at cartoon. You know, these are the dossiers for Romeo. You know that was given by the designer. So they, they make a, a mixed as make design of a sort of a second, uh, second hand uh, scientific knowledge that they were given and uh, their own idea and so on. You know, all of them will use, uh, I saw a lot of them, all of them will use science fiction, comics, uh, 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 I don't know you say uh, of ideas. And finally, you have an horrible result, I believe, in that uh, whatever <laughs> that you see, I show you quickly, which is Romeo. Okay, so what, uh, what I want uh, just to notice, and I think it's the main point of this part by observing how people do, is you have two in a humanoid robot, which is not the case necessarily with an industrial robot, you have two completely logic uh, together. You have the logic, a completely cultural logic, where people take element in different culture, in different uh, literary production. And this is the sort of thing we are, as anthropologists, very used to when we study uh, myth, mask, and so on. And the other one is more the great tradition of scientific knowledge from seventh century. And what is fascinating, it's where is the real choice, I think it's a bit your question you ask, is what proportion in it you want to do. Do you want your robot to be a pure product of a, a scientific revolution? Or do you want to go to something which finally may become completely different? It's a point we are going slowly to. Why it's different? Because another aspect in, uh, in humanoid robots, because robots are not pure objects, static objects, is that uh, the operator is not shown. So basically, the sort of operation, and it could be explained, I suppose, by Professor Bertos or uh, other one, is if you look, if children look at puppets, you know, they can discuss and interact with puppets very well, even by seeing the, the puppeteers. It does not disturb at all the, the scene. So basically, we are in this sort of situation. We're also in this sort of situation in many cultures. And we are where in the place where I work, in the Himalaya, where when uh, there you have people who have the uh, a mobile uh, form of a di local divinity. But if you, if you look at the story, the real story is that people feel they are completely convinced that it's not themselves who were it, but it's the divinity itself which is uh, moving the, the image, the, pal the palanquin. As a result of it, people will have dialogues, will ask questions to the god, and the divinity will answer by his movement, not by speaking, but by its movement. What is interesting is that in a case like that, like in puppets, these people, the people who will ask questions, for example, to a divinity, can ask questions for half an hour or 20 minutes. The people who wear it will change it, will change, and, and still it will not disturb the ritual process. Now we enough with the making of the robot, we go with interaction with the robot who is studied in Kebrolli. I just, to go very quickly still, basically, what are the three stages we identify when the robot is going into the museum? It, it's first, people are surprised because they are quite, uh, they go in the museum very quiet and suddenly you have this robot going around and it, it disturbs their ontology in the sense that normally in the museum basically you have people, yes, things you look at and you looking at the things. There's a slightly disturbing factor is this robot is going not with the object, he is going with the people 
and he look at different objects. Some of them, when he finds them interesting, we, we would have to explain, he smiles and he go in to the, into the direction. When he does not find it interesting, he looks like that, he goes the opposite. And it does the same with people. So basically, he disturbs the sort of a classical ontology of people. So how people will react to it when they see this robot, the first element will be element of surprise, and second element will be to, to, to ask questions and to say it's a machine. Huh? So basically, we, you have a roboticist, ex we explain everything, how it works, and so on. And so basically, they, re they come back to their uh, uh, normal ontology. OK, the world is what it should be. It's not, uh, I'm sorry, it's machine and so on. But there becomes the most interesting thing from our point of view. See, once they have done, they have done that, they go back to the machine and they still discuss for a long time. It's uh, all, uh, two, two or three interventions you have made were going into saying more or less the same. Uh, so, so basically, the fact of knowing that it is a machine does not change their behavior with it. And this, we have, we have many hours of, uh, of, uh, of film about it. OK, this is just showing that. So the question is uh, how you interpret that. So either you interpret it in sort of psychological term, as a trap, a sort of anthropomorphic trap, or as a, you interpret it as a cultural thing, which change the way in which you look at things. Huh? So, and p saying that, what I, I think it's important, this was a reference to the, to the person at the European uh, community, is that the fact it's never the problem if you confuse human and robot. Nobody does that. The real thing is that people treat a machine as if it was a person. And this is uh, something we see the people doing quite often. <coughs> so we come to what is a, by doing this, so what interests us is what does it mean to treat an artifact as it is a person? And basically what it means, and what I want to show now, is that it means that we have a lot of society which dissociate completely the idea of what is a person and the idea of human nature. For example, in the place where I work, which is in uh, the Himalayas, just to, uh, sorry. I, so there you had often sadhu were coming uh, in the village where we were. And, and the behavior of people is very, uh, very respectful, but very suspicious. And I can't go with the story, but why is it suspicious? Because a sadhu can be three different things. It can be what he is, a wise man, and a, some, a saint, some sort of saint, you respect, everything is fine. He can be a crook, like with the priest and so on, because it's a way of, uh, if you have a problem in India, or if you had, because you have no identity paper, so you, you, you d want to, you don't stay in your community, you become a sadhu and you go around, and you may, so people are very wary. And it may be also a divinity, because divinity in India have a habit, not common one, but it may happen to go, a bit like in uh, ancient Greece, for the, you know, to go among the people disguised as a sadhu. You have a lot of representation of Shiva and other divinity as sadhu. So what are you going to do? It means, it doesn't mean it happens often that he is a crook. Uh, it, it happens still less that he is a god. But your way of behaving with a, a sadhu is dictated by these three possibilities. Basically, you are going to treat him as a god with, in the back uh, of your mind, the idea that he can be a crook. You know, so, uh, and, and if you look at it, they, uh, what they do there is much more general as a way in which you treat foreigners. Very for often, for any in this country, you treat very well, but you are very wary as long as you are not absolutely sure of their identity. Okay, so it's a way where you have dissociation between a human person and what he is really. Second case, 
I will not go towards this mobile divinity where people move and it's the divinity moving the people. Sometime I was with them, we had to do to make three or four kilometers that nobody anticipated because the divinity wanted to see a, a friend of his in another hamlet and so and so on. And you have possession, uh, you have no time to go through it. But basically what it means is uh, you could go along very much because it is stone or a lot of things. And, and this now, so and I will go, this is very common. What I saw in India is very common. It's animism, which is at the center of a lot of, uh, of the anthropological debate. And it's the idea which is a bit uh, to formulate it as we formulate it as anthropologists nowadays. I take the definition of Philippe, uh, the scholar that you must know. It's a, the idea is very simple. It's the idea to, to make the also the story very short, is that everyone is a person. You know, you as a human is a person, but you are a person with a human body. So because you have a human body, you react to the world as a human, you see the world as a human, and so on, but you are a person. And, uh, and, and you have a human body. And uh, now, another, other animals are also person, like you are a person, but they may be, you know, another sort of animal. They can be a tiger or whatever. And in this case, you have the mask. They, they are a person, but a person who is a tiger. So because they're a tiger, they see the world as a tiger, and so on and so on. So this is a Basically, and this way of seeing the world by the, in the like uh, with the eyes uh, of other, you know, but as a as a human, it's a, it's a cultural conception, is the most common one in any culture, any society. This still example of it, you know, where you. So what it means basically to make still the story short, it means that the real singularity. I think from an anthropologist's point of view, is not the fact of attributing to a robot the quality of a person as a fact. It's our society which is exceptional in the sense that the point of view that you were defending, that we don't do that, you know. So our, our history in terms of, uh, and because of that sort of, uh, I believe, scientific knowledge we acquired was linked with shifting with this sort of paradigm, for, because that's why I take uh, the draw. So now the question with the robot, and this uh, same thing, it's not f student, no friend, it's just people who saw, we, do, we did not know, is that uh, what is happening now, and this nobody knows where we go, is that it may be if, uh, if the sort of humanoid robots that we have seen were generalized, that at least for the common, the common uh, conception of the world, that would have the one which I have seen in India, in India and in many other places. Now the problem is, uh, and uh, I can't go really with it, is to say just what I have said, to make this sort of statement, is suppose that you generalize, as I said, a very, very small experiment, five minutes in the museum, with it would be to say it would be the future of a European society that to come back to this sort of animism. So this is a problem, and it asks, it begs for a question, which is what is a technological revolution? And to, there also to go very quickly to it. Uh, in fact, a technological re a revolution, if you take it, is a change of ontology, but it's also a change of. A, a, uh, of economics, you know, you have an economic history. You can understand the, the industrial revolution if you don't understand what happened between Birmingham, Birmingham Manchester, Liverpool uh, in the 19th century. So same for uh, age of data, you know, you have a, you have a, a, a change of ontology, but a limited one and you have an economic like Silicon Valley and so on. But the point is, and it's very important, I think, to, to retain this idea that all this is resisted generally. Uh, so it's why I have, I have put Charlie Chaplin. It's not because you had an industrial revolution that everyone considered that the, we are all machine. In fact, people did not uh, 
uh, did not uh, want this story. It's not because we, 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 everyone explained to us that we are defined by your data that we don't think we accept to be considered only as the sum of, of our data. But it is the, ba the basis of the ontology on which uh, Silicon B Valley and a lot of people make a lot of money uh, and work. Uh -huh. So, and to just to finish my uh, paper, to, it's just to say, say, okay, for example, we are in the age of data. We have gone in a true uh, a revolution, you know, an industrial revolution. But just one month ago, I was in South, uh, in South India. Uh, and in South India, they were reinventing boats like that, which have nothing to do with ecology and so on. And if you look, the techniques they use is the same uh, that they used, uh, in, at least in Europe, in 16th century. And one of the biggest mistakes I think we do nowadays is to believe that uh, the publicity, which says that uh, uh, we are at the age of computer, you know, in fact, a lot of other things exist. It's a good historian, if you have not read it, with David Egerton, to give just one example with whom we worked, who showed very well, for example, I, I don't know if you know that, but the time where horses were the most used in any war was the Second World War. You know, it has never been so much use of horses that during the Second uh, War. Well, Okay, so basically to finish, it, is, it was a point made, uh, I think, by Kamsa. It's in order to understand how you go from a small experiment in the laboratory to, uh, to a society doing it. It's a political economy of the thing. For example, in the case of divinity, they exist because you had the system of power with the local Raja who were playing with that to, uh, to, uh, to have their legitimacy. And same thing with uh, the robotic, the robots. It will work as a, it will change the society. And just now it's not uh, completely successful. <laughs> Only if you have a political economy. And uh, on the one hand, people who want for generally economic reason to go after it. If you have people like in your laboratory who give, <laughs> who, who make them. And if in this case, you will have probably a change of ontology. So it's not that we, so I think it's a very interesting time. Uh, and I, uh, it's all what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Denis. Uh, and we have uh, five, 10 minutes uh, before the break. Uh, there are comments, uh, yes, questions? I I can see, I think the listening must be 0,2% uh, of your <laughs> brain at, the, at this time of the day. No? <laughs> Ila? <laughs> Sacrifice. Oh, that's, that's the first question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, no, it's okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. No, it was just like a, a small like a clarification that I wanted to ask you yeah. about the Berenson project. Yeah. What what were you having in mind when you built a robot, and to what extent you choose this very specific design and this like uh, approach to put the robot in the museum? Uh, it was uh, it was completely anecdotal at the beginning. What happened is uh, we were at a congress, uh, not a, not even at a workshop at Collège de France with uh, Philippe Gossier, who is a roboticist, and he said that the Louvre asked him if they if they it would be to make a robot uh, for helping visitors in the museum, and he said uh, it's not it does not interest me. Uh, as, a, as a roboticist. And I was saying, because we were discussing at lunch as we do, I say, yes, it would be more interesting if you can discuss uh, uh, with the robot uh, of his opinion about the art of, of, of the artworks. And in fact, we did the robot who don't speak, but uh, we, and, and, and so we, we discussed during lunch about what, it, it was a thought experiment, as you said, what would it require for making a robot who can uh, be, we have some sort of interest in uh, artwork. What does it mean? 
and, uh, uh, and forgot, I forgot completely the story. And after three months or six months, he telephoned, he sent me a mail saying, you know, I can have a funding for this pro a project. Would you be interested to work mis with me on it? So it's how it was. The point I did not see is um, what is interesting when you observe, uh, and to give uh, in terms of observation, I, have no, I had no time to say, I think we have two hard results. The first one in terms of interesting for roboticists. The first point is that we saw maybe 95% of, of people, or maybe more or less, we don't see as a small child, adults, everyone who has interacted more than two minutes with the robot, when they leave him, when they leave the robot, they say goodbye to them to the robot. This, I mean, anthropologically, it's fascinating because people have very strong emotion at Musée du Crébranly with a sort of, you have to very bizarre object, especially for children. People are fascinated, frightened, they loathe. It's maybe they have sexual connotation, but they never say goodbye to object in the museum. So it's only with this robot that everyone, and, and it's also very amusing as an anthropologist because uh, it's quite, people are quite, educated uh, who visit this sort of museum. So you can see very well uh, the people who don't want to be seen too much saying goodbye to the robots. So they make but all of them, we have the, the film, make small sign, maybe it's what you say of saying, oh, 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 oh. nobody leave it li like that. This is the first observation. Second observation, I think it's that uh, it w people uh, can be very, very obsessed with, uh, oh, he likes me, he does not, because what people, they disturb, <laughs> they change, they shift, or interest what to see, uh, joint attention, you know, for the object, and people, they want to have a dialogue with the robot. He wants the robot to smile to them, and sometimes he smiles, sometimes not, according to his uh, process, you know, which is more or less arbitrary, not arbitrary, but it's the story of what he has seen before. And as a result, you have people who can remain 50 minutes in front to make sure he, he notices them, he smile to them, and so on. And what you see, it's the whole thing become a collective scene, basically. I think if they were al alone, they would not react very much. But because there are many, they, and they say, uh, because we have to, all the films, they say loudly, oh, he likes me, they show, oh, yeah. they show to their friend, oh, he does not like me, and so on. And, and adult with children, they say, say, be polite to the robot, and so on, and so on. So what you see is to become immediately a scene of collective socialization. You know, and I, I think it's why it works. Uh, it, it, if they are just in front of it very quickly, they would l lose interest. But if because they are different people, you have immediately ten people around trying and, and noticing uh, what happened to the other. It's a bit your sort of. Uh, it, uh, I don't know how you call it, this sort of thing, where you see the thing through the eyes, not of the robot, but of the other seeing you, seeing you interacting with the robot and so on. Well, before my question, I have to say this idea of collective uh, socialization around a robot. We had a robot in the 1990s in a museum, and people were rude to it. And we experimented on the robot and finally mm. had it say, us. So it would say, excuse us, we're taking a tour. And then people were very polite to it, because it was becoming inclusive of a social construction of, of us, instead of just me, the robot, as distinct. Okay. Um, what mm. I was going to ask about is you mentioned creationism and evolution. Mm. And um, I have a slightly different view, and I'm curious what you think of it. When I look at the robotics today, and in fact at big data and the way big data is playing, I, I see uh, roboticists and inventors and innovators who are actually combining a kind of neo-evolutionism and creationism. Yeah. What they're doing is they're reinventing a sense of identity. They consider themselves post-evolutionary. And yeah, yeah. with big yeah. data, it's happening faster by far than it can with robotics. So they're changing yeah. society, changing people, and then inventing kind of a future uh, intelligent creature that's a combination, it's a hybrid of humanity and yeah. data and analytics. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think maybe this is something we should be even more concerned about than robots because it will move at the speed of light. Mm. No, I would agree completely. I think when I wrote about it, I called post-creationism 
and post-Darwinism. And, uh, and in fact, as you said rightly, it's fused uh, in some way together. So it's not so, uh, yeah. No, I, I accept it, it was just too short. But uh, I think, uh, but what, what remains, I think, in terms of motif, as you say, so I think it is the frame which is behind, even if, it's, if as you said rightly, if it's for going uh, post, yeah. Okay, thank you, Denis. It was the last question, and thank you, uh, everybody.